Um, and I'm just going to give people another minute or so to log on. Dan, I, what is it like? Oh, Marianne, I don't want to take your question. <laughs> but to see your book on Amazon, I just like, can't even imagine. Yeah, it's it's been, just It was incredible. really fun. I, I, I dropped in a bookstore a while ago, and that was really, really fun to kind of see yeah. it on the table and see the, you know, like the writers who I was next to, you know, on the shelf and stuff. Yeah. That, was, that was really, for me, a really, you know, fun moment been yeah. a little surreal in these like just incredibly wild times but uh yeah so yeah. that was uh, that was really fun so yeah or my my family especially will see it in the wild and send me a pic and that makes me really happy so i bet it does it's you're in the pantheon now that's just cool i don't know about that I, there's, there's a there are a lot of books out there but yeah. it's really sweet well, I do want to um, welcome you all, say good evening to this Meet the Author event with Dan Hornsby, author of Via Negativa. Um, I think I've met almost all of you. Um, you know, I'm Marianne McCormley, I'm pastoral associate here at St. Francis Xavier, and I'm really happy and honored to be able to host and facilitate this event. Dan, a very special welcome to you. Um, you so before we get started, a little housekeeping. Um, you all were muted when you came onto the Zoom, and we're going to ask that you remain muted throughout the reading and the interview. You might find it helpful to put your screen on speaker view or to pin Dan's video, and then you won't be distracted by the gallery of participants. Um, I have, with the help of other St. Francis Xavier parishioners, compiled a list of questions to ask Dan. If you have another question, I'm so sorry, you'll have to track him down on your own. Uh, but hopefully we'll cover, um, cover most of your um, interests. So, we know that God is always all around us and within us. And as Father Dan says in the novel, God is hiding perfectly in plain sight. If you want to see God in the world, all we have to do is see the world. If you want to see God in human form, look at people. Look around, turn around. Our hope for this evening is that it is not just an interesting hour about a work of fiction, but also an opportunity to see God and God's handiwork and thus be strengthened in our faith. So we're going to start um, with prayer. So I invite you to take a moment, to take a breath, to center, to anchor, and to pray with me. God of all good gifts, we thank you for the gift of creativity, for art and music and literature, for this young author, for our time together this evening. We ask that you continue to draw us closer to you and to all of our brothers and sisters in this hurting and broken, beautiful and amazing world. Help us to love everyone and everything. We ask for blessings upon Dan and all authors and writers, mystics and contemplatives, and upon this time we spend together this evening. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and pin Dan's video so I can see him. Hey, Dan. Um, Dan Hornsby was born in Muncie, Indiana. He holds a Master of Fine Arts in Fiction from the University of Michigan and a Master's in Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School. His stories and essays have been widely published, and his first novel is Via Negativa. He lives in Memphis with his wife, author and teacher Alice Bolin. Bolin. And of course, he's the son of our parishioners, Jeff and Peg Hornsby. So welcome, Dan. Would you like to start with a reading from your book? Yeah. Um, so I will just kind of take it from the top, just for those who haven't read the book. Um, 
Yeah, and I'll just read the kind of first short chapter. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I just want to make sure I'm not, I'm not going in and out. All right. Okay, so this is, where, this is where it begins. Somebody hit a coyote and I pulled over to the shoulder to take a look at it. I'd watched it bounce off a minivan 20 yards ahead of me, a gold smudge. At first I thought of, it might have been a paper bag tossed out the window, or maybe an old t-shirt, until I saw its big yellow eyes and tail flopping around as it skittered onto the gravel, rolling like a stuntman on fire. By the time I walked up to it on the shoulder, it was lying on its side, taking quick shallow breaths and staring up past my head. One of its legs looked like it had an extra joint. I reached out to touch it, and it didn't bite. I ran my finger along its hind leg, and it didn't move. With a spare blanket from the trunk, I wrapped him up. I could, see, I could now see he was male for whatever that's worth, then stuck him in the back seat next to the bucket, the books, and my duffel bag. I grabbed two of the books and shoved the rest into the footwell so they wouldn't shift onto him. I set the coyote's head on the selected writings of Origin of Alexandria and wedged my collection of the venerable, venerable beads homilies between the seat belt and the blanket to brace the animal's ribs and diffuse the pressure of the strap when I buckled him in. He was panting hard, so I poured some water into his mouth and, after I'd made sure his tongue had drawn it in, poured a little more on the blanket for him to suck on if he got thirsty soon. Before I drove off, I stuck half a nerve of him in his mouth and heard it fizzle on his tongue. Origen, that spiritual genius of the second and third centuries, says we can go up or down from age to age. Someone could be a monk and then, after a snobby life of chastity and starvation, come back as an angel. Or you could go backward. You might come to as an animal, a pigeon, a rat, a coyote, and then drop to demon or go down to whatever is below that. The idea of this behind this being that at the beginning of time, we were all made of fire and turned toward God in constant sizzling contemplation, burning up his divine fumes. Most minds, with the sole exception of Jesus, he says, turned from him, became distracted and cooled, and from then on we were stuck with our husky bodies. Now we can go up or down. But eventually, even those at the bottom will climb their way back up to God when time calls it quits. I haven't read Origin in a while, admittedly, but I'm pretty sure that's the gist of his cosmic scheme which he would say is somewhat metaphorical anyhow. Thanks to a couple first millennium controversies among the monasteries of lower, lower Egypt, Origen was never canonized. There are pictures of him standing at the pulpit, preaching to a congregation of saints, Augustine, Ambrose, a haloed crowd in which he's the only one with no light shooting out of his head. Somewhere in Illinois, I changed the blanket. The coyote had pissed and shit in it. A good sign, I figured, but the car was beginning to smell. He left a foamy stripe of puke on origin, and some of it smeared onto bead. I wrapped him in one of my towels at a rest stop. He was as light as a throw pillow. He didn't move at all. The back leg looked pretty bad, bent slightly the wrong way. When I touched it, he jerked out of his daze and snapped his jaws. I'd need to set the bone. A woman stepped out of the van park next to me. Got yourself a little buddy there, father? She walked over, and before I could stop her, she stroked his nose. Doesn't like to travel. I gave him one of those pills. He's a little out of it. I can tell. Well, I hope he gets there safe. You too. God bless. I buckled him back in and threw the blanket into the trash. He joined the monastery of Monk Wearmouth when he was seven, as an oblate, a pure oblatus, literally a child offered, part of a practice of dedicating prepubescent boys to monastic life. It probably wasn't the best for child development, but the monks who did this moved through scripture like fish in water, my theology professor used to say. I went to the minor seminary at 14, St. John Bosco's. This was in Indiana in the 60s. There's still a few places like that. It's the closest thing to being an oblate you can get to in recent memory. There were a lot of oblates in the Middle Ages. It simplified inheritance to send off a second born son or ninth born in my case to a monastery before he reached puberty. Many of the best medieval scholars were oblates. William of Ockham was an oblate. So was St. Boniface, I think. I roomed with three other boys and we were far from little beads or Ockhams. We found the room where the older priests kept their whiskey, gin, and cartons of cigarettes and broke into it all the time. Sometimes we'd hitchhike into Indianapolis and try to meet girls. More than once, a couple of us brought some back to the seminary and made out in the grounds charitable shadows. The priests didn't object to this as much as you might think. The boys were trying to get one last look at what they'd be giving up should they graduate to the major seminary and go through with ordination. 
I don't know what the girls were trying to get. The seminary was not a very romantic place. Everywhere you looked, a saint or an angel was there watching you, staring up into the side the way they always do. Last night, a couple hours after I picked up the coyote, I stopped at a campground off the highway. I parked the car near a tree inscribed with the, mes with the message, JB was here, fuck Ron. I almost stepped on a Kentucky fried chicken bucket. Some animal had torn it apart. The colonel's face stared back at me, mutilated and sinister, like a zombie's. I unloaded my supplies from the Camry. They'd given me two weeks to move out of the rectory, and in that time I ran a number of tests. I took, a book, uh, I took a bucket and one of those circular cushions they make you wear when you break your tailbone, and with these I made a kind of chamber pot. I soldered together a foldable grill. I have a master's in art, and I've always been pretty good at making things. Over the years, I kept picking up new crafts. I've worked with pewter, clay, wood, PVC pipe, and in one disastrous project, human hair. So it was fun for me to put these things together. Something in my knee popped when I reached to grab my tent. It was so loud even the coyote turned his head to see what was going on, but it didn't hurt too bad. I'd be all right as long as I didn't fully extend my leg. Despite his curiosity about my knee, the coyote was still pretty dazed. I put on a pair of leather driving gloves and bound him up in the towel, leaving his broken leg sticking out like a kettle spout. I buckled him back in so he couldn't turn and bite me. And then I took some plaster gauze from my first aid kit and started wrapping the broken leg with it. The coyote didn't like this and started wriggling, but then he passed out because of the pain, I think. With him lying still, I managed to set the leg pretty straight and used up most of the gauze because it seemed likely he'd chew through it if there wasn't enough. I drizzled water on the wraps so they would hold and then turned up the air so the plaster would set faster. Once he came to, I gave him the other half of the pill. When I was done, he looked like one of those mummified cats you see pictures of in National Geographic. With the coyote bundled up, I pitched my tent. Lying there in the dark, I thought I heard something or someone moving through the trees about 50 yards away. I pulled out my flashlight and shined it into the bush, but there wasn't anything. If you're alone long enough, your mind begins to populate the world. I think that's why the Desert Fathers, St. Anthony, Arsenius, were always battling demons. I'm not saying those demons weren't real, I just think you have to be alone for a long time if your brain is going to be able to see anything special. I grabbed one of the books from the car and tried to read it by flashlight. After mindlessly skimming a few pages, I felt something sticky on the spine. Some of the coyote's bile had caked onto it. I wiped it off on the side of the tent. I fell asleep about an hour after that. Thank you, Dan. Thank yeah. you. Um, so you were born in Muncie. Father yeah. Dan served a parish in Muncie. Uh -huh. Your mom is an artist. Your dad taught at Ball State. Uh -huh. In the novel, we meet an artist named Clara who teaches at Ball State. So our first question is, okay. how much of the book is autobiographical? Or well, yeah. maybe, maybe a better way of asking the question is, in the writing of the book, how did you take bits and pieces of your own life and your own experiences and weave them into the narrative. What was that process like? Yeah. You know, okay, so I watched this, this is a little out there, but I'm, I'm just gonna go for it. I watched this documentary on sound design in movies, right? Because like, you have to have a, an, an aural experience of a movie as well as a visual one. And so, you know, it's common to make like an alien sound. Someone would take a bear and a dog and maybe a pig or a child and they would m put all those sounds right on top of each other and then you get this thing that isn't really any of them, right? And I think a little bit of, you know, some of the strategies just to write a, a novel, you have to just take stuff from life, right? Like you're writing about the world, you're in the world. Um, so you kind of reach for some of the things that make sense to you, whether that's like textural, you know, like, okay, what music would Father Dan have listened to as a teenager? or, you know, anecdotes from friends or family. Um, so like we had a priest friend growing up who briefly lived out of his car and he was a very artistic guy. And so there are some anecdotes that come from him, but that was kind of more of a starting point for me. Um, Cause he, you know, the guy that we know, he's a much better guy than Father Dan. Um, 
so yeah, so that that became kind of a way, and I could kind of absorb other stories, you know, things that I had heard. You know, I went to a fairly conservative Catholic school growing up, so some of that lore was around stuff that I learned in divinity school, kind of following my spiritual interests. Um, and all just kind of sticks together, and you start to shape it and hope that the different pieces begin to talk to one another. Um, well, yeah, so really there's, there's kind question. of a mix. Yeah. yeah. Well, this really is a question that came from our discussion last week. Um, do you have personal experience with desert retreats, nudists, mushrooms, uh -huh. mysterious chess games, odd roadside attractions, or living in your car? So you already kind of addressed the, the, um, yeah. the living in the car, but like... Yeah. Um, I mean, it's stuff that I know about or I know people who have, you know, like I knew a kid when I was in high school, he worked at a, at, at part of a custodial service. And so he had something kind of like, he played a chess game with someone okay. he never saw. And I thought, I've always liked that story because there's a kind of conversation between some invisible partner. Cool. So this is, it's a kind of thing that, yeah, that story for me is now it's, you know, a 14 year old story, but it kind of stuck around in my head from when I was in high school. And, you know, I found a way to kind of put it there. Um, because to me, it's a, you know, that could be about God, or it could be about a relationship with, you know, th the invisible world that's around us all the time. Um, um, yeah, so those are the kinds. Of, I was in a band in college and, and after, and, we, you know, we did a lot of regional tours. And so you do see a lot of strange little things as you drive from, like, tiny town to tiny town. And so some of those roadside attractions kind of trickle in. Um, but I like those because I feel like they're kind of um, a tacky American version of a pilgrimage, you know, okay. where, you know, if you were a medieval pilgrim, you, you would travel, you know, hundreds of miles possibly to be physically present at the shrine of a saint. And, you know, if you were sick, you might spend the night there and hope that the saint would bless you that you might be cured of your ailment um, and forgiven, you know, any mortal sins or anything like that. And, you know, in America, it's like, well, we don't have that kind of like connection to a kind of divine infinity. So we'll just have the world's largest concrete prairie dog, like they do in Kansas, or uh, a taxidermy three-headed cow, you know, and you get to kind of dip your toe into history and infinity that way. Um. In the book, um, you tell us, and you just read this part, that the Venerable Bede entered the monastery at seven and Father Dan went to seminary at 14. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself when you were seven and 14? Were you writing at that young age? Were you a journaler? Were you collecting stories? And what was your prayer life like or your sense of God? Yeah, um, well, when I was a kid, I think, I, my, so my mom was uh, an art teacher for a while, and she taught all of my brother and sister and me, but especially, I mean, my brother and I loved to draw. And so I was obsessed with drawing, and I was obsessed with animals, which I think is still a thing that kind of trickles into my work all of the time. Right now I'm writing a short story set at one of the, like, uh, big chimpanzee sanctuaries in the South. Um, so I'm, I'm, obs I'm still obsessed with animals. And I've always been really fascinated with animals. Um, and I think it's funny because like, as I got older, I realized like my spiritual interests and my fascination with uh, like the natural world, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. that's kind of an artificial way of just talking about the world we live in, the physical world we live in. But um, they're kind of the same thing, you know, the animals and plants and really all kinds of forms of life are this window into, you know, the creative, I, I, how to even say it, but like a kind of like creative essence of God, you know? Um, yeah, so I think that's one thing you see in this book too, is that, uh, you know, even Bead the Coyote is a little way to kind of invite mystery into his Camry, you know, but he has to bring it in too. And, and I think that's, it doesn't just, wake up in there. He has to 
go out and seek it. Um, yeah. Hope that one, of our, some of one of our parishioners asked if you were a former priest. If I was a former priest, yes. yeah. Did you ever uh, consider priesthood? Yeah, I, there Do was you a still priest consider yourself that, Catholic? That pushed me being a priest pretty hard when I was a kid. This guy named Father Mike. Um, he was a really sweet guy. And uh, I didn't, you know, they because they talk about like a calling. Like a, it, it's very epiphanic. I don't actually think it's like that for a lot of people. Like, I don't think that it's like, you know, Samuel, hey, get up. You're going to you know, anoint the king of Israel. You know, I think for a lot of people, it's a long conversation uh, with that possibility. But when I was a kid, that's kind of how it was, you know, uh, conveyed to me. And I didn't feel it, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. But I, as, after I did my MFA in fiction, I found myself writing and reading more about people with deep spiritual conviction and finding myself really inspired by people in the past who express a kind of spiritual creativity, um, whether that's someone like, you know, St. Francis of Assisi um, or the, you know, the early desert Christians in lower Egypt who find their way into my book. Um, you know, these are people, they didn't, there was no Franciscan order before Francis, right? There wasn't, uh, the, the, even the idea of a monastery, I mean, for people living in like the, you know, Hellenistic world. There are monasteries from other traditions, obviously. But, you know, they had to be creative to organize themselves, you know, outside of a really powerful empire and outside of these kinds of like, you know, social pressures and controls. Um, and I, you know, I just found that moving and it, it kind of led to, you know, me eventually studying theology more seriously um, and that still finds its way into my writing and is still a part of what I think about all the time. Do you have anything else, anything more you'd like to say about why the writings of Origen and Bede in particular play such a significant role in the book? Yeah, Origen is funny. He, so Dan, you know, this is a, this is an important thing to say, right? Like, obviously he's not me. He's kind of, a, you know, some kind of shadow self or other Thing. You know, he's a made up person. He's a character. Um, I, that always is, especially with the confusion around the name. Um, the name is a way, is kind of a way for me to link to him and helped me kind of talk to him or figure out who he was. And then it stuck because it felt kind of right. There are a lot of Father Dan's, right? There are a lot of Mike's and Dan's among the Irish Catholics. Um, but origin, and so, so Dan isn't me, and Dan isn't always right. Like, he, Origen doesn't think animals have souls the way that, like, Origen wouldn't think that you would, could be a coyote. He would think that you could be, maybe be upgraded to an angel, or that you might fall into some lower kind of status on the chain of being, right? So there's some things that are fudged by him and he, that leak into his, but what, what's interesting, what I like about Origen and that little part that I shared is that it, like, its estimation of divine love is very high. That all, all thinking and feeling beings with time will find grace on, in some, on some path and make their way and return to God. Um, and that's not like, Origen isn't, you know, he's not uh, a doctor of the church or anything like that. But he is really influential, you know. Um, especially on like Augustine and, and others. Um, but I really like that. I just think it's a beautiful idea, you know, even if it's, it's kind of wacky, but like just the way he can, he, you know, explains it, but I, I, I find it incredibly moving and also kind of shows Origen's compassion in a way that I, I find touching. Beautiful. Um, the clergy sex abuse crisis plays an important role in the plot of the book. Father Dan says at one point, I considered leaving. What good was the church in the end had the institutional church done more evil than good? Can you talk a little bit about how the sex abuse crisis and other failures of the institutional church affected your own relationship with the Catholic church, your faith? <laughs> and when did you decide you wanted to write about the crisis? Yeah. Because I realized I mean, that 
you know, the, the Boston Globe story yeah, yeah. broke when you were just a little, little kid. Yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about it. It's, you know, that it's incredibly personal and that's a, just such a painful thing. I want to be open about it and talk about it. I mean, I, that, that didn't, I, to be clear, like that didn't happen to me. But, you know, as a kid, we were talking about like, we had to give these current events presentations in my, you know, Catholic school. And we knew about the sex abuse crisis, like when we were 12 and 13, like it, we found out about it, you know, we like heard the news and watched the news and stuff over our parents' shoulders. And it seemed like a big deal to us. And we were like, okay, of the events of the year, this year, like, we're going to say this and like George Harrison dying, that was a big deal for some of us who love the Beatles. But like, we were like, this is a thing, this happened. And we were told like, we couldn't include it, we couldn't talk about it in our presentation. And we didn't really understand that because we didn't see that like we didn't think that like it was we thought oh we should we can be open and talk about it and we were told not to do that and that like you know the the higher ups at our school didn't approve of that and that was like i don't know that was it, it left a kind of weird tiny scar in my brain because it then it made me think oh something is very seriously wrong because there's silence around it. Um, and in the book, you see that too. It's like, it's the silent, it's this Dan's refusal to acknowledge pain and this trauma that his friend has experienced um, is, is, is the engine for the book. It's why it's called the negative way. You know, it's, it's, it's not just the theological tradition, but it's also this thing that it's Dan's negotiation of his, of his accountability or culpability just as someone who was silent um, when evil things were going down. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know, it's incredibly thorny and painful, I think, for a lot of people. Um, yeah. So was it during your time, so, so the question about when did you decide you wanted to write about it? Was it when you were well, working on first, the MTS or? Yeah, I was, you know, I didn't start out thinking that the book was gonna be about that. I just was interested in this idea of a priest who was kind of an artsy guy trying to live in a more direct kind of apostolic way. Um, and then I realized like he had this friendship with another priest and I realized kind of, I kind of slowly discovered, it sounds really dumb, but I just kind of kept circling closer and closer to the emotional reality of the book um, that had to do with this pain and this kind of like, very serious wound uh, that is both, you know, his and his friends, and I think the, you know, contemporary Catholic churches too. But it was kind of a discovery for me. It wasn't, I didn't set out to write something that was like, you know. Um, when we had our discussion last week, uh, we, we were all really struck by how Catholic the book is. You know, that it's like, oh, this is a really, Catholic book and so um yeah like what what do you think makes it very Catholic I'm just well, curious I, that, that I think sense. I think a lot of it the context is very Catholic it's about a priest it's about sex abuse yeah. crisis it's about parishes and liturgy and ritual but also I think it's very Catholic in that understanding of sacramentality you know that, that yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, you know, the created that. world and I mean I think this obviously the spirituality and and so much of it really resonated with me I, I'm wondering what was like when you were writing did you have a target audience um as you and your publisher are promoting it are you yeah are you thinking about catholics or disaffected catholics do you like do you know who's reading the book have you heard from i, yeah. I think i think some people like who want to read this book other than us you it know? does make it is a little you know the, the way I feel about it and it's a negotiation of kind of like its relationship and my relationship to the institutional church and the, is that like it has a lot of affection in the book and I really wanted it to have like its own sacramental theology. I wanted there to be kind of, and most of the sacraments are kind of there if you, yes. you know, if you look like there's, a, there's a confession, there's, nice. there's, Eucharist. Eucharist, there are a couple Eucharists. Um, and marriage, and, Tim and Paul. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that I think that kind of, and even like uh, a kind of 
um, last rites, mm -hmm. kind of with the with the with King Bruno? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe that too. <laughs> Oh, well, that's not where you were going. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, but with like the 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 Roma and stuff. Yes, um, yes. But I also wanted to just be clear-eyed about it. And you know, one of the things that's like priests are so often depicted in film, especially and novels, as these kinds of like they they're just kind of there to facilitate maybe some kind of confession scene with the screen. So someone can say they killed somebody. You know what I mean? They're kind of hollowed out. They're like judges in, uh, you know, like a courtroom drama. They're they're a stand-in for something else. And I really wanted to explore, like, the spiritual and emotional reality of of being both in a community and not being at the center of the mass in a lot of ways, and also on the edge of the community that you're serving. Yeah. You know, like you're not you're not integrated in the same way, and and they're there's power and but there's also there's just a lot there you know and that negotiation is really interesting to me and um yeah um so okay so so this question i think follows father dan talks about different kinds of priests uh -huh. guitar playing pot smoking pedophile communist alcoholic gun owning golfing tennis playing but we didn't know what you meant by Eisenhower priests. So uh -huh. if you could explain that. Yeah, and, I think those are the kinds of, oh, sorry, okay. So go ahead, what's an Eisenhower okay. priest? The Eisenhower priests are just like, if you're a baby boomer and you grew up and you were educated by nuns, these are the kind of shades, you know, that are, you know, the, the priests that kind of are in the background of your education or there in your, you know what I mean? They're the kind of like American white bread, suburban, you know, Eisenhower era. Yeah, that would um, be, that would imprint on you pretty heavily, I think, if you grew up in, yeah. those, in that, in that context. What kind of priest do you think the church of the 21st century needs? Needs, oh. That's, these questions are hard, guys. This is, uh, <laughs> very heavy this is it's going a little deeper than i <laughs> i, I what think do people you know, want to know dan or oh it's maybe what i want to know yeah sure i well i just think it's like yeah, I'll, I'll just put it very simply and quickly because it's incredibly complex but it's like if we don't look at the most marginalized people in our society and try to find like the presence of well like recognize that that is the beginning of that's where we should start, right? Like we need to center that and figure out how we can take care of the poor and the sick and people who are mistreated by our systems, right? And so I think we need like that, like, I don't know. We, it's that, that's where we start. And I think that the it, priests in any form that facilitate that are what we need. That can steer a community towards more justice, social justice, uh, economic justice um, and take care of people who are ignored or are erased. Um, yeah, that's that's probably the start, I would say. And you know, Pope Francis is some is someone who gives me a lot of hope. Uh, yeah, as someone who seems who I don't know, it, you all know this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of our parishioners was disturbed by how snarky. Father Dan was about Saturday evening worshipers, uh -huh. Presbyterians, and Protestants in general. Um, okay, yeah. Father Dan seems both genuinely open, compassionate, and accepting of the people he meets on the road trip, but very harsh, critical, and unforgiving toward his parishioners and others in his yeah. life. I love Can you this. speak to that? This is, this is, uh, we're getting into it. Okay. okay. Well, I think part of it is like, he is a, he's a person with a lot of problems. You know, he's a human being. And so I think like, I like him, but he is, and he strives to be good. And I think is good in a lot of ways, but he also has a lot of serious failures and flaws like we all do. And I wanted to create an imperfect person, you know, who is trying to figure it out and is trying to figure out this chapter of his life. Um, 
And so he's judgmental. You know, okay, I will say the Saturday evening crowd, I will say, like, in my mind, it's like, come to the feast, y'all. Like, go, like, be around, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's more of like growing up, I remember the Saturday evening people wanting to go in and out, you know, going to like the poorly attended mass or whatever. And the, the diss there from Dan's point of view, maybe it's something I share, is like, the banquet is here. Come eat, come like see the people and be around. Don't drive through. You know what I mean? I'm sure your Saturday evening crowd is cool. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's more of a cri criticism of that in an offhand funny way. But he's a person with flaws. He's, he's messed up and he's gone through a lot of stuff as a character. And, you know, he, he so some of those moments of criticism of other people reflect that. Um, it's not really, I mean, the Saturday evening thing I think is funny, but <laughs> I'm not really, I don't have beef there, you know. Um, now, um, some of your readers um, found the book overwhelming and confusing. Uh -huh. The timeline is complicated uh -huh. and sometimes hard to follow. There's the narrative of the road trip interrupted by stories of Father Dan's recent and distant past. Yeah. There's a lot of characters. Many of them are unlikable. Uh -huh. um, and then there's the theological and the spiritual teachings. Um, yeah. And I, for one, found the ending surprising and abrupt. I have to tell you, Dan. Yeah. Literally, I can tell you what chair I was sitting in my house and I'm reading the book and I get to the page and it's like, what? I really thought there was another page to the book. Yeah. I mean, like, I, it's like the book is over. So, yeah, yeah. Um, this Can you talk a little bit it. about the structure of the book sure. and how you put the book together? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. There are, there are a couple of ways at this. I'm, I'm going to try just, I'll just talk about two. I started writing it, you know, there's a poet, Fanny Howe. She has this poem called Catholic. It's kind of a prose poem and something about the tone, the voice and what it was is speaking to just, hit me in the face. I was in this class that was, I took, because like, when I went to divinity school, I was still like, I am a writer. I'm going to learn about this stuff for the purpose of fiction and for the, like for my, you know what I mean? Where it's like, I'm not going to be a theologian, I guess, or I'm not going to be a pastor. Like, this is stuff I want to engage, I want to engage with those ideas. And I mean, and the writing is, a, it, that is, you know, part. so, but I took a lot of classes with pastors or people who wanted to be pastors because they offered other ways kind of into thinking about some of these ideas. Like I took a, a course on just um, Christian contemplative traditions. And it was like a lot of kind of Christian spiritual experimentation where we read The Way of the Pilgrim, which is this 19th century Russian text. And we like did the Jesus prayer and people talked about that. And what was that like and things like that. Um, and so once I read that and we were, kind of, we were kind of engaging in that and I was thinking a lot about the Via Negativa, I started writing something kind of in that voice on index cards. And so that slowly fused. And so structurally, I was kind of inspired by like if you read like the little flowers of saint francis or the sayings of the desert fathers they're almost to varying degrees it's it's like when you watch like uh a cartoon and they're like how is bugs bunny here and then and the next he's, he's with romans and then here he's in greece and you know what i mean they kind of jump around um and have these little episodes and i really like that and so i wanted to kind of replicate that in a subtle way um and as I wrote more and more, the index cards fused together into a longer narrative. And I realized I needed a kind of structural justification for the project. In To the Lighthouse, the Virginia Woolf novel, she draws a little H in one of her notebooks. And so it's like the first day is one of the columns of the H. And then time passes, so it's just one day, it's very compressed and you get the whole day for many pages. And then time passes, it's this little bar on the H it's 10 years, but it's in a very short span. And then um, there's another day at the lighthouse again. 
And so it's this H. And for me, I wanted to do something like like the like the labyrinths. Maybe you guys mm. have a labyrinth. Do you ever do it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Where you circle in to the kind of fundamental reality of the of the novel. So that like let's think of the events like his relationship with Paul, um, his childhood, things like that as cardinal points. So one, two, three, four. As he makes his way around the labyrinth, he might talk about Paul, might hit this point, talk about his childhood. Circle, do another lap, might talk a again, but he's going closer to the truth. Mm -hmm. And then circles, and then hopefully, you know, we get the, the heart of how he feels and what has happened. Um, but I wanted to like do that in a way that have a kind of narrative approach that mirrored the negative theology that he is a fan of. So that he wouldn't look these things head on. That's not how he, um, that's not how he believes, you know? And that's not how he engages with the world. Um, and so that's what the kind of via negativa is. It's this theological idea, but it's also a, his kind of, a, his, his uh, a emotional strategy for dealing with pain and beauty, maybe. Um, the, 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 the ending. First yeah. of all, did you always know the ending was going to be the ending? Uh -huh. um, and is that is that kind of part of um, uh, contemporary fiction? That that's what one of the parishioners said. Maybe that's what maybe that's what contemporary fiction is, and that they don't have a certainly don't have a happy ending. They don't have an ending at all. So so was yeah. it always going to end the way it ended, or um, yeah? Um, so the way it ends is like. I mean, what, Marion, do you want to describe how it ends for people? I mean, it's not going to give anything away. It's an no, no. image. So, I mean, it, it, it ends where Father Dan has gotten all the way to Seattle. He's had, I think, kind of a brutal conversation with his dear friend, Clara, who I feel like holds up a mirror to him and says, basically, you haven't been a very good friend. I love you, but... And he goes out for a walk, and and he... Is that the point where he sets the coyote free? And so it's like, anyway, there's rustling in the bushes. And honestly, Dan, like a few pages before that, he's walking across um, the the road. There's like an elevated. Oh yeah, bridge. Yeah. Bridge. I thought he was gonna jump. I thought he was. I, I thought he was gonna kill himself because I was so. I was so depressed. It's like after that conversation with Claire, my heart was broken. So anyway. Yeah. So the. I mean. Let's see, it's the very last part of the book. Spoiler alert, I'm just kidding. Spoiler alert. It's really nothing to spoil. Um, the man left, I stayed on the bench, staring at the ferns and lanky trees. I put my hands in my pockets and felt something strange in one of them, a world cone. It was the goat's horn from Paul's cemetery. I ran my fingers along the little ridges. I blew into it, but of course it made no sound. The walls of my life didn't come tumbling down. As I got up, I heard a rustling in the brush behind me. I turned around and a bush began to shake. Something was in it. I waited to see what it was. Yeah. So it ends with wanted, him waiting? Yeah, I think I wanted a, a mystery at the end. You know, I wanted something like, I mean, if, 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 if yeah, I wanted, I feel like for Dan, it's like uh, I spent a lot of time with him, a couple of years with him, and it's like you're kind of driving like your two cars on the highway, or you're behind, you know, this this other car on the highway, and you go for so long, you have a kind of affection for that car. But at some point, he pulled off this way, and I went this way, or and so I don't know what's in store, but I think I wanted to leave the kind of garage door open for the cat of mystery to kind of run in for him, and so. Yes. That's, um, that's what that is, I think. And I think the truth is like, I hope that there's still time for redemption and change and possible, you know, transformation for him. And so I think it's like, that's as much as I can give him. Well, and, and one thing we talked about last week was um, you know, like, it seems like the book could have a sequel or at least some fan fiction around it. 
uh -huh. or maybe be part of a series. And I think part of that is a tribute to you that the characters are so vividly drawn that I almost feel like there could be a book about Anna or a book about Bruno or a book about Tim and Paul. Yeah. You know, like, so what's it like for you as an author to create characters, uh, but just know part of their story and to not know the end of their story? What's that like for you? That's an interesting question. I think, I mean, I don't know, because it's, it's hard because you kind of, you create a personality at the other, especially with Dan, I do feel like attachment to him and a lot of affection. And I always, whenever I would hear writers talk about like a character feeling real to them or whatever, I always thought that was bullshit. Uh, but then I did it and I was like, man, I actually like, like him, you know? And I wanted to give him a lot. Like I wanted to give him a history and not just like, he's an old person thinking about his youth, but he's like, he thinks about what he was doing in his fifties. He thinks about what he was doing in his forties. He think, you know, I want to give him a life with more texture. And so it is kind of painful, honestly. And I, I felt kind of like when it was done, it was, you know, you, you feel kind of sad. Uh, do, you, do you feel that way about the, the nurse who went to Haiti or about Paul and Tim? Like, because I really, I'm curious about them too. Yeah. I mean, all the characters are very vivid to me. I, yeah. Maybe because I'm a lonely person. I don't know. It's been quarantine. Yeah, no, I think those characters, I don't feel, it's not the same. I think when you kind of write in someone's voice, there, you, there's just a little more connection to how he, how he thinks, how I think. Yeah. It's, a, it's a weird little mess. And uh, yeah, that's. Um, so this is, so I, I, I watched a YouTube review of your book, uh -huh. a guy named Ernest. I don't know who he oh, was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But one thing he said about your book was he was struck by the fact that the size and shape of the book is like a devotional prayer book. Uh -huh. He felt like it was like the size of a prayer book. Um, was that intentional? And what was the process like to choose the size and shape of the book, to choose the cover art, even to choose you know, your picture on the back, uh, the jacket yeah. flap. What, what was the process like of getting the sure. book published? Yeah, that's a fun question. Um, so I didn't really have any say in like the dimensions. That's all kind of just done by the people at Knopf or Penguin. Um, but the cover art, I was given a couple options. There was a, a mock-up that was done fairly early on. And I like show it to my wife, I show it to my mom, and I'm like, do you like this? Or is this good? Uh, just send it to my dad, you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, the first one we didn't like very much. I was kind of worried, like, even this, it's like, is it too, like, I, I did not want like a priest's collar way up front in the, you know what I mean, as yeah. the thing. Because I want it to, I want you to think of him as a person and not just his job, you know what I mean, or his role. Um, or I didn't want it to like signal Catholicism too hard. I kind of want, wanted it to, I wanted that to speak for itself. But I kind of, I, what I like about this cover and I think why we went with it is just like all of this negative space and the idea of the kind of like stained glass window. He talks about that a little bit in the book. Um, and it just kind of made visual sense to me. And I love that there's so, so much of that darkness kind of around the light yeah. on the cover. Um, yeah. Do, do you know who's reading your book? I mean, I know that you've been, uh, you've received really positive critical reviews from really impressive sources. Um, but like, do you know who's reading it? Like, have you heard from Catholics or disaffected Catholics or? Yeah, actually I have. Um, I've got, I've received a couple emails kind of along those lines and I don't really look at the, I, when the book was coming out, I, I would look at the like Goodreads or the Amazon reviews, but I don't really do that now because it just makes you feel weird. Even when they're good, you're like, oh, you know, but um, it's just painful. Um, but yeah, it's, I think a lot of people who, you know, maybe grew up Catholic and then still feel they have loyalty to a lot of the ideas and the kind of best parts of the church, but have 
have left. Um, I think that it speaks to them and a couple of people have reached out to me kind of in those terms. Um, and other people who grew up in more like conservative religious contexts as well, who maybe they weren't Catholic, but maybe it's, you know, some, some kind of cr strict Christian environment or culture. Um, yeah, so that's been a part of it. Some people who, who like teach about religion and literature have, have read it and kind of boosted it. Um, but yeah, kind of a wide range of people. Do you have any thoughts about the increasing number of nuns in our country, N-O-N-E-S's, people that don't have any oh, yeah. uh, religious affiliation. Do you have any thoughts about what that means for the future of denominational Christianity? Yeah, I, it was hard, like when we were, when I was trying to, you know, like me and my agent were trying to sell the book. Um, it was hard to, I wanted to convey to editors, you know, like, there are a lot of people who are interested in, like, obscure corners of Christian theology. It is true. There's just a lot of them. And, like, and they're, like, they live in small towns, you know? They don't just live in, I don't know where, where you would imagine. They don't just live in Kansas City or they don't live in Omaha, but they might live in some rural place, too. Like, there are a lot of people who are interested in these ideas. Um, and... You see that trickle in, like there was that film First Reformed, the Paul Schrader, <laughs> Ethan Hawke movie. Um, Fleabag was a show on Amazon, and there was a prominent priest character in that, um, just kind of a coincidence. You know, I think a lot of people in this moment where, you know, there's this idea of a hyper object. Are you guys familiar with this? It's like a something that's too big for a mind to kind of fathom at once. So global warming my, is, a, is the kind of main example for that. And it's like, it's just like, you can't grasp it. And I think that there are a lot of problems that we face now that are, are these kind of hyper objects. Yeah. And that like modes of spiritual thinking help us figure out our ethical relationships to one another. Like, what do I owe someone else? You know, like what, what do we owe each other? Um, and so, so I, I think there's, I think there's a resurgence of that yeah. and it's much, it's much stronger than people think. So I would agree with you uh, beyond um, the idea, beyond, beyond ideas. Do you, what role do you think ritual and community had to play in terms yeah. of answering those ethical questions? Yeah. I mean, because I feel like that that's I feel like that's what I'm selling right as someone who actually works for a church it's like I'm right, kind well, of selling it's incredibly this incredibly valuable that... to have relationships between like a community like if you go to your church and you see oh there are young people there are old people there are it, it is like not everyone is from the same ethnic background or extraction not everyone is from the same economic class right like where you have a real community you know it's mm -hmm. not just like a bunch of people who are the exact same laser demographic. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's incredibly valuable to like understand what the world is, who we are as people. And it's incredible, like I have a, a friend in his seventies and we'll like sit outside and talk. And that relationship is really valuable to me. And Alice and I have a friend and they're like 22 and we talk to them and get a sense of what they think you know what I mean it's like having I don't know and so I think like it's really hard to find a big community like a, a site of community you know yeah. and it's incredibly important um the hour's almost up there's a couple more questions I want to get to this yeah, okay we can is, do like um, a, a speed round or something there is a lot of mess in the book yeah shit piss vomit <laughs> bile yeah. all the stuff in father dan's car and then all the characters who are human sinful flawed complex a lot yeah. of that one of our parishioners was struck by all the disappointments misunderstandings all the reaching and trying and uncertainty in the book yeah. is this your understanding of the via negativa and how can we have peace with the mess should we even try to have peace with the mess? 
Yeah, I took a class know? with Cornell West at Div School, and he called he called it the funk, which is like the human condition, the kind of swirling, gooey problem of being a person. And I think it's like more and more I'm moved by like our brokenness, our ugliness, uh, what might be seen as disgusting. Like those things, when, when we have, when you feel that, it's kind of an invitation to actually step outside of yourself, right? That there's like, that are, you think about like Jesus in the gospel, he is going to, he's touching people who were like considered unclean, mm -hmm. right? And he's socializing with people who are considered spiritually unclean. Um, and I find that really moving. I find that like, that's an invitation that like we are, it's our responsibility or calling to go to the gooey, gross, funky, messy places and try to figure that out with each other. Um, and so I like, I like the really, and I think that is a Catholic thing, but like, like even in uh, the divine comedy, right? Like demons fart in, you know, the, in, in the inferno, right? Like there's something about that kind of like embodied kind of gross humor too, that I think is, is kind of like old cat, like medieval mm -hmm. Christian, but I kind of like a little bit of that as well. And I think it, it kind of cantilevers abstract ideas. You want to talk about like a, a disembodied or, you know, things that aren't like the Via Negativa, it's against images, it's against mm -hmm. language, right? And so it's like having this other stuff that's very embodied and very mm -hmm. like, has to do with being in a body, being, you know, incarnated. Um, what would you hope that readers would get or learn or realize from the book? What's your hope for your readers? Yeah, well, I really want them to, you know, I, I bring in a lot of other people in, in Father Dan's spiritual pantheon, and I felt like growing up, it was like, maybe you had the lives of the saints at most, but you don't really get, I didn't get a very good window into Christian history or the history of, of theology. Um, and I think that would have helped me a lot. <laughs> like as I tried to figure out, and it's no one's fault. Um, but learning about, you know, it's like, there were women in the 13th century who left their families for a little while, the Beguines, mm -hmm. and they would go in together and get people like, Beatrice of Nazareth or Meister Eckhart or others to come and do kind of like, you know, speak to them and give, and give sermons. And, um, and it's like, I didn't know about that. That's so cool that people had radically reimagined a way of being like a lay person in society. Um, or you think about the desert fathers. It's like, I knew, I, I knew St. Anthony swirling around with some demons or like, you know, the Dali painting. But then you think about all these these monks and and in some cases nuns too, all these men and women who went out into the desert and created community together. And I think it's really cool. Um, and so I want the book to give people like, for people who are into this, like uh, some more cr spiritually creative kind of like artists of spirit, you know, like artists of spirituality so that we can like start to think about new ways of being and living together. And each of us can find our way. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dan, this has been just wonderful. I could keep talking to you. I really want to keep talking to you, but um, is there anything I should have asked that I didn't ask that you want to say about the book or about your own life or shout out to your mom and dad? I don't know. Yeah, sh I Shout out to Peg and Jeff Hornsby. The best parents imaginable. I see them. I'm choked up. I haven't seen them in person in a year, really. I'm just like, oh, oh that's but hard. Anyway. But um, yeah, thank you so much for this. And thank you all for your attention and your time. I know these are just in just wild times. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Well, I'd like to I'd like to close with with prayer, really just a prayer of blessing for you, Dan. You just um, oh. I'm grateful. Um, 
And uh, I think that one of the things you said tonight that really struck me, and I guess that would be my invitation to all of you is, when you think about this hour of, of listening to me and Dan talk, like what's a takeaway? And I would be really interested if you would shoot me an email and let me know like, what's one of your takeaways from this conversation? For me, it was you talking about origins estimation of divine love is very big and so i guess that would be my prayer for for all of us for our whole world our whole nation but especially for you dan and for alice that um you just continue living in that very big divine love so thank you very much thank you all for being part of this this evening yeah, thank you email all and let me know what you thought god bless you